The Persona series is no stranger to having spin-off titles. There are two fighting games, three dancing games, and even two full-on crossover dungeon crawlers. I actually do plan on covering these games in the future. I mean, this retrospective wouldn't be complete without them, but for today's video, I'm going to be jumping ahead to the latest in this long line of spin-off games, Persona 5 Strikers. Though, calling it just a spin-off is actually doing the game a huge disservice. You see, despite the fact that this game was developed by Koei Tecmo, the team behind the Dynasty Warriors games, this is very much a follow-up to the original Persona 5, not just in terms of story, but also in the way the mechanics were adapted into this new genre. I'm going to be doing something a bit different this time and discuss my thoughts on the story first. This is mostly because while I enjoy the story of this game and have a few things I want to discuss, there isn't as much dissection to do here as there would be in a mainline game. Plus, the game is brand new, so I want to give people the chance to experience it for themselves. I don't want to be the one to ruin any of the surprises in the story. I'm going to be avoiding talking about major spoilers, but there's going to be some minor ones just to get my point across. So if you absolutely want to know nothing about the story if you're interested in Strikers, Please skip to the gameplay portion of this video if you're only curious about that. I'll give you a few seconds to do so. A few months after the events of Persona 5, Joker and Morgana return to Tokyo so that the gang can go on a camping trip during summer vacation. Not too long after their arrival, however, trouble begins to prop up when it's discovered that the hot new AI assistant app known as Emma is linked to the metaverse. At first, the Phantom Thieves believe that the palaces are appearing again, but it's not as simple as it seems. These new cognitions, known as jails, function drastically different. Their purpose is to be ruled by a monarch, and these leaders are responsible for stealing the desires away from people, brainwashing them into doing the monarch's bidding. While inside the jail, Joker comes across an AI known as Sophia. While Sophia seemingly doesn't have her memories, she proves herself useful to the Phantom Thieves thanks to her combat abilities, as well as her knack for being able to pinpoint the locations of other jails. You see, the jail in Tokyo wasn't just a one-off incident, as there have been jails popping up all over Japan. While our group has no involvement, the police begin to suspect that the Phantom Thieves are connected to the sudden change of hearts that have been happening thanks to the Monarchs. So the Phantom Thieves are now on a cross-country road trip in order to not only free the captured desires, but also prove their innocence and discover the truth about Emma's connection to the metaverse. That's the basic setup to Persona 5 Strikers, and for the most part, the story falls into an episodic-like format, more so than the original Persona 5 does. The Phantom Thieves will visit a new city, discover that there's a jail, return that area's captured desires, and then be on their way to the next part of Japan. But this formulaic setup isn't used to tell a lazy story. Something I was surprised to see was how much Strikers focused on evolving the characters past the original Persona 5 story. When I first started the game, I thought that having jails was going to be nothing more than an excuse to get our characters back into the metaverse. But I was honestly shocked at how much effort really went into making these new dungeons distinct from palaces. While palaces are meant to reflect reflect the distorted desires of the ruler and how they view the world, jails are more so focused on the monarch as an individual, along with their past trauma. Something that I noticed right away in Strikers is that the villains are presented in a far more sympathetic light. This is in strong contrast to almost all of the palace rulers because those people were irredeemable criminals. Someone like Kamashida is a character that you can't sympathize with. He does horrible, disgusting things to his students, so it's satisfying to see the fan of these change his heart and have him confess to his crimes. He works well as a one-off villain because he's someone that we want to see fail, even if we don't know too much about his personal life. You can't really say the exact same thing about the Monarchs and Strikers because not only what they're doing isn't nearly as despicable as Kamashita, we get more insight as to why these people turn into Monarchs. For example, the first villain the Phantom Thieves take down in this game is the idol, Alice Hiragi. When we're first introduced to her shadow, we see that she has the desire to control others. She treats people as nothing but toys for her amusement, elevating her own social status and overall just abusing her powers because it's entertaining. But when the Phantom Thieves visit her trauma cell, we learn that while she was attending Shujin Academy, she was the prime target for bullying. These people made her youth miserable and even attempted to sabotage her by spreading the same insults while Alice was trying to start her career. This leads her to abuse the Emma app in order to humiliate the bully as an act of revenge. This small taste of power would eventually lead her down the path to becoming the monarch we see at the start of the game. While the Phantom Thieves are able to sympathize with her, that doesn't change the fact that what she's doing by using the Emma app to manipulate the masses is wrong, so they have to put a stop to her. All of the monarchs fall into this category of being sympathetic villains, whether that be because they want the recognition that they believe they deserve, fixing a past mistake, or doing what they believe is the best for society. The monarchs in this game make for very interesting antagonists for the party. Something that I very much appreciate about this story is the fact that the characters themselves can relate to the villains. 
The first three jails that the Phantom Thieves visit, on surface level, sound awfully close to certain palaces in Persona 5. I mainly want to focus on the jail located in Sendai because that's where I felt it the most. This jail's monarch is Ango Natsume, an author whose novel titled Prince of Nightmares is all the rage in Sendai. It's to the point where fans of this piece are willing to assault people and beat them to near death for any criticism it receives. But as it turns out, almost all of the contents of this novel are plagiarized from other pieces of work. But because of the Emma app, people are none the wiser. If we remove the Emma app from the equation, we have a story of a man who plagiarizes others' work for fame and fortune. It's a very similar story to the Madarame arc, even down to Yusuke being a key player in both stories. While Yusuke was a victim in the original Persona 5, he actively takes charge in trying to stop Natsume from going down the same path of his old sensei. This is a very familiar situation to Yusuke, and he's able to relate to Natsume since he's a fellow artist. There's a lot of time dedicated to how Yusuke views Natsume's work, and by the time they change his heart, he demands the author to not quit writing and instead try again with his own original work. This story focuses on Yusuke's views of what an artist should be, which is something that we never got out of the original Persona 5 story. This is is something that Strikers does a lot. We see the basic concepts of the original palaces bleed into the jails, but these ideas are turned on their heads because the characters are able to apply their experiences to understand the monarchs. But this isn't done to the point where it becomes predictable since there are plenty of original ideas here. Overall, I think that the antagonists in this game are pretty solid, but the thing I'm honestly surprised with the most is the overall quality of the writing and, more importantly, the characterization. The Persona spin-off titles are pretty infamous with the way the characters are portrayed. The biggest example of this is in Persona Q, where characters are boiled down to nothing more than just one single core trait. Needless to say, I was worried that Persona 5 Strikers would suffer from the same fate, but thankfully the characters all act as the same phantom thieves we all know and love. And as I stated when talking about the Monarchs, the characters are actually developed further. But something I want to focus on are the two brand new characters created for this game, those being the AI companion Sophia and the public security officer Zenkishi Hasegawa. Let's start with Sophia because she has a lot more screen time dedicated to her. Sophia's story focuses on her trying to understand the human heart, as well as discover her reason for existing. When we first meet Sophia, she has no memories. The only thing she knows about herself is that her directive is to be humanity's companion, and a good chunk of the main plot focuses on her learning what that directive means. Outside of the metaverse, she exists as an app on Joker's phone, where she's used to detect the locations of jails all around Japan. Even though Sophia has access to all of the knowledge she needs thanks to the internet, she doesn't understand the complexity of the human heart and how emotions can control people. There are many points throughout the story where Sophia tries to contemplate the actions of the Phantom Thieves. She asks Joker questions relating to the events in the game in order to gain a better understanding. What I do appreciate about Sophia is that even though she's an AI, she still has a very well-defined personality, which is the most enjoyable aspect of her character. The story she's involved in is somewhat generic, but it's well done. An AI trying to learn what it means to be human is something that's been explored in a lot of media. It's even been explored with Igus from Persona 3. Without giving too much away, learning Sophia Sophia's true purpose is connected to one of the major antagonists of the game, and the story between these two has a pretty satisfying conclusion, but it doesn't exactly reach the emotional highs it's trying to. This is mostly because Sophia's relationship with this character is dumped on us during the second to last dungeon. I just think that there wasn't really enough time to establish this. I think that this scene works well as an explanation of Sophia's origins, but not as much as a big character revelation. I do really enjoy Sophia, but between the two additional characters, I personally believe her to be the weaker link. This is mostly because I think that Zenkichi was just the more interesting and compelling character. I really, really like Zenkichi. When he's first introduced, he reveals to the Phantom Thieves that the police suspect them of the mysterious change of hearts all over Japan, and he wants to help them clear their name. While he may look intimidating and untrustworthy, he's actually a very easygoing person who's used for a lot of comic relief. But there's a lot more to Zenkichi than it first seems. He's a character that suffered through a tragedy of his own. This not only damaged his self-worth, but also fractured the relationship he has with his daughter. On the surface, it's a very similar story to Nanako's and Dojima's from Persona 4. In fact, if you've played that game, it's even the same tragedy. But what separates these two stories from each other are the differences in how those events affected the families. Senkichi's character arc focuses on not only rebuilding the relationship with his daughter, but also catching the perpetrator of the crime. I know this sounds a bit vague, but going into any more detail than that will require me to spoil more than I want to with a game this new. But I still want to give my overall thoughts on the execution of Zenkichu's character because I ended up getting pretty invested with his story. 
He's someone who has a strong sense of justice that has to keep tabs on the Phantom Thieves throughout the game. Even though they are potential suspects to the police, he eventually does grow attached to them in a way that's paid off beautifully. Zenkichi is the one to show the Phantom Thieves that the world isn't as black and white as they believe it is. Good people can do bad things, and those bad actions can't be excused, no matter the intentions or past trauma that led them to that point. Overall, I like the story here. It isn't anything too complex, but what's here is solid. It's safe to assume that you've already played the original Persona 5 if you're thinking of getting Strikers, since for all intents and purposes, this is a sequel. The characters allude to past events, and old ideas are twisted and shown in a new light to provide a different experience. This is complemented with some solid characterization, and genuinely really fun moments with the original fan of these and the new characters as well. But now onto the gameplay portion of Persona 5 Strikers. While the story quality was a pleasant surprise, what really had me interested in Strikers was the gameplay. I just want to start out by saying that I have no prior experience to these Dynasty Warrior-esque games, so I'm talking about this game as a complete newbie to the genre. After putting around 40 hours into this game, it has a lot more in common with the mainline Persona games than what I was expecting. Persona 5 Strikers takes the core mechanics from its turn-based counterpart, and crafts a fun and exciting action combat system out of them. It's nothing that I would call particularly deep, but it's far from being shallow. You alternate between your normal and special attack buttons to execute combos. These inputs are universal across all party members, but Strikers goes through the effort of making each character unique. Ryuji's gimmick, for example, is that he can turn himself into a hard-to-stagger tank, and charge his combo finishes to a devastating effect. Effect. Compare this to Yusuke, who attacks far faster than Ryuji and can quite literally perform Virgil-style judgment cuts. If I'm being honest, I didn't use every character equally. I definitely had my favorites for sure. Yusuke, Ryuji, and Haru were in my party for a good majority of the game. I used Makoto and An as my backups. They share the same gimmick of applying elemental affinities to their basic attacks. I do like playing as them, but I find my main party more useful in a lot of scenarios. Morgana's main gimmick is that he can transform into a bus mid-fight. It's an alright attack. I didn't really use him much, but he's not a bad party member. Sophia, on the other hand, is someone that I just didn't really like playing as. Sophia uses two yo-yos as her main weapon. The gimmick with her is that if you press the attack button with proper timing, you can power up her yo-yos when she catches them. This timing is somewhat strict, but there are visual cues to help you learn the timing of your button presses. I just couldn't get the hang of it. You're always surrounded by enemies in this game, so trying to pay attention to the visual cues ends up being more trouble than it's worth. What would you rather do? Learn the precise timing of an attack by studying the character animations in order to maximize the character's damage? Or just hold the triangle button at the end of a combo as Haru to achieve the same effect but with less effort. Sophia definitely has her uses because she specializes in blessed damage and healing, but for me personally, I'm just not a fan of her gameplay style. Something that I appreciate about Strikers is that you gain access to all of the party members very early on. Since the characters share a universal control scheme, it's not a challenge to figure out the differences between party members. The game even gives you a quick explanation of the character's main gimmick when you first take control of them. What really helps separate the characters are the specific abilities that they have access to thanks to their personas. At any point in battle, you can hold down a button to freeze time so you can summon your persona. Much like the main games, you can exploit enemy weaknesses and get critical hits in order to knock down enemies for an all-out attack. The main difference in Strikers is that Persona skills now have a certain range to them that's highlighted before you perform the skill. Personas are very useful in combat because they can be used to quickly clear out rooms of enemies, and are almost integral against the bigger shadows in boss battles. In order to do decent damage to these enemies, you need to exploit their weaknesses until all of these shield icons break. When that happens, you're able to do massive damage with an all-out attack. Strikers teaches you almost all of its core mechanics in the first few hours, and doesn't really evolve past that. The closest we get is the mastery system. After directly controlling a party member enough, they'll learn a new mastery art skill. These are more so just buffs to their already existing attributes than outright game changers. Thankfully, you can change your party composition outside of combat in order to keep things fresh, and something that I for sure wasn't expecting to be in this game was Joker's wildcard ability. The Velvet Room in Persona Fusion still exists in Strikers. Whenever you defeat an enemy, there's a chance that a Persona Mask will drop from it. This is your primary way of acquiring new Personas for battle since the drop rate is already pretty generous. You can switch Joker's Persona anytime if you want to adjust his elemental affinity or gain access to new skills. Using a different Persona will also change Joker's combo finishers, so it's a good way to cast magic without draining any SP. Though, a spell casted through a combo finisher won't be as powerful as just casting it normally through the skill menu. 
Persona Fusion has been altered in Strikers, and I'm honestly not a fan of this new direction. You're given a list of all possible Personas you can make at your current level, along with any alternative ways to fuse said Persona. This, on its own, is perfectly fine, but the problem is that for some reason, the Personas that are used as ingredients have to be at least a certain level that's listed or higher. Granted, there's a way to instantly level up a Persona in the Velvet Room. You can spend what are called Persona Points to give a selected Persona experience points. But there are a few limitations with this system. Joker's current level acts as a power ceiling, so you can't just make any Persona level 99 unless Joker himself is level 99. There's no problem with that since the ingredients used for fusion are always a lower level than the Persona you're trying to make. But some of these Personas ask for some very odd combinations, such as including early game Personas that you have to have at a ridiculously high level. Now hold the fucking phone! In the other games, all you needed were the right Personas and you could fuse whatever you wanted to. Sure, the protagonist has to be a certain level, but putting this on the Persona requirements too just makes the process far more tedious. The best way to level up Personas is by spending Persona points, but it costs a lot of points to bring certain Personas up to the required levels, and the best way to get Persona points is by discarding Personas from Joker. What I ended up doing was discarding my highest level Persona in the Compendium, buying it back, and repeating the process. Sure, this ended up costing a lot of money, but it nets back a bunch of Persona points. I find the idea of making sure you have the correct level of Persona needlessly tedious. Anyways, combat never really got tiring for me because Joker is just as customizable as ever. In terms of difficulty, I'm apparently in the minority thinking that this game is moderately difficult. I don't think that it's an incredibly hard game by any means, but boss battles always kept me on my toes. The optional bosses especially are pretty tough, but the reward is worth it because you unlock new personas for fusion. Regular encounters don't put up much of a fight, but there were a few mini bosses that definitely caught me off guard. Dungeons do have frequent checkpoints that let you go back to the Velvet Room or to return to the Overworld to restock on items. Something that Strikers doesn't feature from the regular game is the social sim aspect that the series is famous for. The absence of things such as confidants and social stats doesn't really bother me personally. With the way this story is structured, it would be a nightmare to add those into the game. But you still do get gameplay benefits for increasing your bond level with your team. Your bond level is essentially a second experience bar that rewards you with bond points whenever the level increases. You can spend these bond points on passive upgrades, such as increasing the effectiveness of items or increasing how much money you earn from battles. I understand that this isn't the exact same as Confidant abilities, but I appreciate that the developers tried to implement them in some way or another. As much praise I've been showering with this game with, there are a few complaints that I think need to be addressed. Most of them are minor, but I believe that they are at the very least worth mentioning. Much like the regular Persona 5, there are requests that you can fulfill in jails, but in my opinion, I find most of these uninteresting. A lot of these requests amount to defeating a certain number of shadows or re-challenging previous boss battles. These requests aren't difficult or test the player in any interesting ways. The boss rematches especially feel like padded content because they aren't any different from their first battles. Not all requests are boring, however. There are some interesting ones here such as having to reach a certain part of the map without fast traveling or alerting shadows. I like these requests because it tests the player's knowledge on the map design. They aren't too challenging because you can still ambush enemies without it counting as a failure. One that I mentioned earlier is that there are optional bosses against very powerful shadows. These fights are very fun and are especially hard if attempted right when you unlock them, but sadly I find half of the requests pretty unremarkable. Something that I find very annoying about Strikers in general is how often you have to return to the overworld when doing all of the game's content. You can't register a request as completed until you return to the real world. So if you want to clear out the list, you have to back out of the current dungeon you're in just so you can cash in for a reward. This is particularly annoying because you can only accept 8 requests at a given moment. This feels like an arbitrary limitation. What exactly would having the player cash in requests during the dungeon do other than save time? I understand this is more of a nitpick, but it occurred enough times for it to get legitimately annoying. These are the only two things about the game that bothered me, and even so, they aren't really that big of an issue. Sure, the requests are lame, but I still find enjoyment out of them because of how much I like this combat system. It isn't that deep, but there's plenty of fun that can be had with it. My biggest fear in terms of gameplay was the thought that it was going to be a mindless button masher. While it can get slightly repetitive, especially if you marathon the game, Persona 5 Strikers manages to stay at a consistent high quality because of the surprises it throws at the player. 
Overall, I think that Persona 5 Strikers is a very solid game that manages to evolve not only the characters, but the story and gameplay alongside it. In my opinion, Strikers is a spin-off in name only as it features almost everything that people like about the series. The biggest change is with the combat. I understand that going from a turn-based RPG to a different gameplay style may put some people off, but Strikers manages to stay true to its roots while providing a fast-paced and addicting combat system. The only thing it's lacking in is the social simulator aspect, which doesn't bother me personally, but I have to acknowledge that there's a portion of the Persona player base that's mostly in it for this aspect. If you're one of those people who are on edge about Strikers because of this exclusion, I implore you to at least give it a shot. Almost everything about this game is great, including the character writing, which is something I was not expecting to say about a Persona spinoff. If you're already interested in Strikers, then this game is going to be something you'll love. In my eyes, this is a worthy follow-up to Persona 5, and I would love to see another game in this style. This is a road trip I'm not going to forget about anytime soon. Hey everyone, thank you so much for watching. I'd like to give a special shout out to all my patrons whose names are on screen now. If you enjoy my content and are willing to support me, I encourage you to check out my Patreon in the description below. Every donation makes a difference, plus I have a few things I can give back in return such as early video access. We've been swimming in a lot of Persona recently on this channel, so for the next video I'm going to be analyzing Digital Devil Saga. As much as I like Persona, I want to try to veer away from exclusively making videos about it, and I believe Digital Devil Saga will be right up your guys' alley. Expect that video to be out sometime in March. If you want updates on that project, I suggest you follow my Twitter or join my Discord server. Both links will be in the description below. So thank you so much for watching, and take care.